What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you the rankings of the 55 CRPGs that I have reviewed, which is a video I did make some time ago, all the way back in 2022 if you'd believe that, and since then I've reviewed quite a few more of these and people have actually asked me for an updated list, so I thought that would make for a fun video given that things like Baldur's Gate 3, Rogue Trader, and even Colony Ship have released since that prior video. Now with that in mind, a few things to note here at the beginning of the video. For starters, we're going to be moving fairly quickly here. There's a lot of games to get through and I don't want this to be like an hour long for no reason. So while I'll give a quick synopsis of each game, do keep in mind these reviews exist. You can go watch the actual review if you want more information about any given title. Moreover, this is a ranking of the CRPGs that I have played and what I would consider the best ones. These aren't even necessarily the order of my favorites, but it's worth mentioning that as a channel that covers CRPGs pretty extensively, I enjoy pretty much all of these on some level. Even starting from the bottom of the list, I like them a fair bit. And then last thing before we dive into this fully, it's also worth mentioning that the exact definition of a CRPG does change and move around a bit depending on who you talk to, and there is far from a unanimous consensus on the matter. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. I'm sure myself or someone else will happily chime in about it. But with no further ado, let's actually dive into this thing. And we are kicking it off with Lionheart, Legacy of the Crusader. I would say a very niche CRPG from back in the early 2000s, right as Interplay was closing. And was one of the last games out the door from Black Isle Studios. And that knowledge is crucial to Lionheart because the first thing you'll probably know about it is that it is an unfinished game. The back half is woefully underdeveloped and that is because they were faced with a choice of releasing it as is or canceling it outright, and they chose, of course, the former. That said, Lionheart takes place in an alternative history universe during the time of the Crusades, involves all sorts of historical figures, and utilizes some fantasy mixed with the Fallout special system. It had a lot going for it, it's a pretty cool game, but unfortunately it falls apart in the last half like I mentioned, so as much as I enjoyed the first half, it is unfinished and it feels so, and thus it's all the way at the bottom. And in a not dissimilar situation, we then have Gothic 3. Gothic 3, of course, the final game in the trilogy for Gothic, there is technically a fourth one that no one really enjoys that much, as it basically just used the name. Gothic 3 was released to, I would say, just about everyone disappointment as the game was a bug-ridden mess and largely still is, mostly due to a fallout between the developer and publisher, which is decently documented information if you want to go look it up, but the result is that Gothic 3 was nearly unplayable. And playing it these days requires uh, quite a few patches just to get it going and actually be able to even do things like, you know, move. But if you're willing to put up with all that and actually dive into the game itself, I think there's a decently good time to be had running around the various regions of the game, completing side quests and kind of just getting up to your own thing, making choices, deciding how things play out. So it's not that the game is entirely without merit. It's just that a lot of the systems aren't fully fleshed out or as polished as they should be. So as a result, you're likely to get frustrated playing it more than anything else, which is a really disappointing way to finish the trilogy given that Gothic 1 and 2 are so good. Speaking of Piranha Bytes, the developer though, we then have Elix 2. Elix 2 is the latest game from Piranha Bytes, and it was a pretty disappointing experience after the pretty great time I had with the original Elix. Elix 2, unfortunately, is almost the same game as 1. They changed and adapted very, very little. Some of it is arguably worse, like the graphics that somehow just look bizarre in comparison to the original, and a story that honestly didn't make a lot of sense. So they followed up the first title, which was this janky great time I had, where I was building up a character and moving through the world and had me excited to see what they did with the story, with this very lackluster second title that I didn't think had any of the charm of the original, and frankly played it a little too safe. So I wouldn't say Elix 2 is terrible, especially if you enjoyed Elix, but I do think it's the worst of the two and left me pretty disappointed overall because I can't help but think of what it could have been. Now, slightly different, we then have Shadowrun Returns. Shadowrun Returns is so low, not because it is bug-ridden or has any problems, it's just an incredibly small game. It's more of a tech demo in a lot of ways. A playthrough of this game is probably going to run you like six or seven hours, there's not much of a point in replaying through it, and while it's a pretty decent primer to Shadowrun as a system, and the story's even decent, it just doesn't have a lot going for it otherwise. 
Now, because of its limited nature, I will occasionally see people throw it out there as a great game to get started with CRPGs in, but personally, that's not something I agree with because this game is so short and so limiting in its options that I don't think it really represents the rest of the genre particularly well. But if you're looking for like a one-shot adventure you could knock out in a day, I think Shadowrun Returns can definitely fill that role for you. Another small title following up after that, though, is Space Wreck. Space Wreck is a title that is very heavy on choice and consequence. There are tons of ways to play through the game, tons of different character builds to make, and while those individual runs might only be like three or four hours, you could easily play through it half a dozen times. And while it's not the most visually impressive game and combat isn't exactly going to blow you away, the number of ways you can resolve any given situation is incredibly high. There's all sorts of non-combat options, combat options, and a few different things in between. And you're going to explore all of that while you're simply trying to find your way home in an unforgiving world about, of course, space wrecks. Then we have Divine Divinity, the game that kicked off the Divinity universe. In many ways, it's more of an action RPG than anything else. Some people will even refer to it as a Diablo-like, but personally, I think it blends genres a bit, and also it was pretty ahead of its time considering it released back in 2000. But as much as I like Divine Divinity, it is riddled with a few problems here and there. It's prone to bugging out on you. And while you might be able to get through it without a problem, you might also run into nothing but problems. Nonetheless, this game covers the story of Lucian the Divine from Original Sin 2 and how that person rose to power to begin with. This is actually the story of how they became the Divine. So lore-wise for Divinity, it is incredibly important. And it even features a little bit of choice and consequence alongside a relatively open world to explore. Next up, though, we then have Risen 2. I would say a good game that just so happens to be a bad sequel to the original Risen. Risen 2 takes a game that is, I would say, pretty traditional Piranha Bytes following their gothic series and turns it into a bit of a pirate game that is more focused on action than the rest of the systems. And while a lot of those hallmark things that make it a Piranha Bytes game are still in there, it feels very different from the direction they had in mind with the original Risen. And it's a game that, despite being a direct sequel to the first one feels a little better if you think of it as its own thing rather than a sequel to the original. And if you're willing to do that, Risen 2 is a pretty good time that will see you tracking down more of the Titan Lords as humanity tries to escape their wrath. Following on from that, we then have Greedfall, whose sequel we'll hopefully be learning about here before too long. Greedfall, though, takes place on the Isle of Tirfredi a recently discovered sort of lost paradise that people are trying to explore and find the cure for a deadly affliction that has taken hold on the mainland. Combine that with a little sort of almost renaissance period swords and sorcery, and you've got an interesting title that's full of choice and consequences, companions to interact with, and a character to build. Greedfall was very good, and I'm excited to see if they can expand on that and really drive home that lore and universe with the second entry to the title. Moving right along, though, we then have Risen 3. Risen 3, I think, is where the Risen series kind of really hit its stride. It combines a lot of what worked from 1 and 2 and makes something that is genuinely just fun to play and closes out that trilogy pretty well. Personally, I still didn't like it quite as much as the original, which is why we're on the third one now, but... I will say gameplay-wise, it's probably the best of the three. You have a ton of different options. They also kind of backtracked on some of the more restrictive changes they made from Risen 2 after, of course, the reception that game received. And thus, of the Risen series, I would say 3 is the easiest to enjoy if you go into it blind. Though, again, still a bit different than what you might have imagined when you played the original Risen. Next up, we have one of my favorite post-apocalyptic CRPGs with Encased. An interesting take on a Fallout-like Ascension where we take on the role of an employee that goes into the Dome. The Dome is a semi-permeable, recently discovered area of vast technology, with the catch being that while people can go into it, they can't leave. Only objects can be shipped back out of the semi-permeable barrier, and thus there's this whole little microcosm of culture and society that takes place inside the Dome, especially after some anomalies render it in a sort of post-apocalyptic state. It's a game that's, again, all about choice and consequence, freedom of approach, a storyline that can be completed by not killing anyone or killing everyone, the usual suspects. And while it's certainly a little janky in comparison to some other CRPGs and kind of really shows its indie roots in that particular instance, it's still a fun time, even if it's not quite as polished as some other games on this list. 
Another great post-apocalyptic title, though, is Age of Decadence, one of the titles from Iron Tower Studios. This one is a bit of a cult classic, a post-apocalyptic game with some Roman leanings, though not literally in Roman times, and it's all about creating a character and sticking to that role. This is a game you can play through probably eight, nine, ten different times and see something new every single time, maybe an entire path through the game you didn't even know was available to you based on the stats you chose. The only thing you have to be careful about with this game is that it is definitely possible to create a character that isn't viable, and it's probably a little too restrictive in that regard. And while the game does a fair job, I would say, of warning you about exactly this, it's important to remember that you need to kind of parse through your options and take the route that you actually have skills to succeed in. And if you're willing to do that, Age of Decadence is a fantastic time, even if it's not the most technically impressive game. Following on from that, in a not-so-dissimilar situation, we have Sol- Lasta, a game that uses D&D 5th edition in a bit of a rules-as-written fashion that aims to recreate the actual process of a campaign, which has, since its launch, released multiple DLC campaigns focused on adding choice and consequence to those and has made me pretty excited to see what tactical adventures the game developer happens to do next. Salasta, though, is fantastic if you like Dungeons & Dragons 5e, especially the combat side of things. And that's to say nothing of its very robust dungeon builder that lets you make your own campaigns, not that dissimilar from something like the Neverwinter Nights campaign editors. So while it's not exactly graphically impressive, I think they've done a lot of great work with Salasta. And if you're looking for something that aims to recreate the tabletop experience, it's a great option for you. But then we have Black Geyser, another indie CRPG that unfortunately ran into some trouble after launch, but this particular one puts us in the role of a world that is dealing with a curse of greed. Basically, the entire world is suffering from greed in some way, and your character's actions will play into that quite a bit, which can then have further effects on the actual world itself. Changing locations, changing how people react to you, turning them more bloodthirsty, the greedier you happen to be. And overall, it was a pretty interesting concept. If you liked the original Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, you'd probably enjoy this to some degree, though admittedly the combat, which is its own system, isn't quite as impressive or refined as something like D&D with all of its iterations, but in spite of that, it's still a pretty good time. That said, this game didn't sell particularly well, though the developer has kickstarted a DLC, so whenever that comes out, you'll likely see me cover that as well, but it's definitely a decent CRPG if you enjoy them. Which then brings us to Icewind Dale, the slightly more dungeon crawler Infinity Engine experience, a sort of cousin game to the Baldur's Gate series, where those games focus more on story and narrative. Icewind Dale and its sequel are more about the actual dungeon crawling. And while the second one does have a pretty fantastic story as well, and even the first ones is decent, it's just not the prominent set piece that it is in Baldur's Gate. And thus, if you like the systems at play in those Infinity Engine games, you'd likely enjoy this one to some degree, and it still has a lot of fun things you could get up to. Then we have Atom RPG, another Fallout spin-off, if you will, that takes place in a post-apocalyptic USSR. This one, though, very much so aims to recreate Fallout 1 and 2, down to things like the inventory, and if you liked those games, you'll almost certainly like this. It's a little buggy and a little janky at times, but otherwise is very freeform, a lot of approaches, a lot of ways to build a character, and while combat can be a little sketchy given how building a character works, if you want to just look up and follow a build guide or something like that, I think Atom RPG is great if you want to play something similar to Fallout. Which then brings us to Dark Envoy, the sort of indirect sequel to Tower of Time that puts us in the role of two twins who get caught up in the middle of a war between humans who are new to this world and and the older races who have been here the whole time. You can pick a side and run with it, making some choices along the way, but also engaging in the unique combat system that was present in Tower of Time 2, but is honestly a bit more refined here and easier to enjoy, that sees you hand drawing some abilities that allow you to shape the area of effect for them, which I thought was pretty cool. And it's a fun game with a fantastic story. Tower of Time had a really great story, and this follow-up to that is also really fun to engage with. So as far as the indie CRPGs go, this is another great one. But then we have Torment, Tides of Numenera, a sort of spiritual successor to Planescape Torment that's all about its story, and combat takes a bit of a back seat. Instead, they have these crisis encounters where combat might not necessarily even be the focus or trying to win it even, and in many ways it's much more of a narrative game. But the world they've built here is incredibly interesting, 
I think it has a lot of really cool set pieces, a lot of interesting situations, and while it's a little bit limited in its scope and what it's trying to do, the story is fantastic. Then we have Wasteland 2, the sequel, of course, to the original Wasteland back in the 80s. Wasteland 2 did a remarkable amount in actually trying to be a sequel despite being released in the 2010s. It actually followed up on a lot of the lore of that game and didn't try to reinvent the wheel or the lore, rather simply make something that follows on to that and continues what that original game had set up, which is pretty remarkable. Realistically, I'd say Wasteland 2's main problem is that the balancing towards the end game is off, to say the very least, and that some of its systems can be a little, I would say, archaic, which may or may not work for you. Overall, though, it's a great game. It has a more serious tone than the third entry, and as far as modern CRPGs go, you should definitely check it out. Then we have Colony Ship, a game with a fantastic premise and is actually from the same developer as Age of Decadence that sees us aboard a generational ship a ship on a several hundred year journey to a distant star system, and your character will have never known Earth and likely will never know the outcome of this journey. So mostly you're just trying to survive, and there's a ton of different ways to do that. Now this game does take a lot of lessons from Age of Decadence and aims to be a much more approachable experience, and while there is still that sort of hardcore experience where choices are very important, how you build your character matters, and what your character is capable of doing should be forefront in your mind but it does have an easier difficulty if you want to play somebody a little more combat heavy as well that aims to help you out through the experience. Basically, if you liked Age of Decadence, this game is fantastic and a big step up. It's still very indie, but it's got a great story, a great premise, and a wonderful system of choice and consequence. Then we have Gene Forge, the first, of course, of the Gene Forge series from Spiderweb Software, one of the company behind most of the indie CRPGs I still need to get to, those being the Gene Forge and Avernum series. Series, but the original Gene Forge was great. I specifically played the remake to the original called, I believe it was Mutation, and all of the Gene Forge series puts you in the role of a shaper, wizards who can shape life and create monsters or servants to do their bidding. And that comes with all sorts of ethical dilemmas and moral quandaries that the game doesn't shy away from exploring and getting to the bottom of. It is an incredibly rich world with great choice and consequence, and it's definitely one of the better indie CRPGs out there. But then we have a very well known title with Pathfinder Kingmaker. Coming in at roughly the middle of the pack, Kingmaker is an interesting game because on one hand I pretty much love all things Pathfinder, but Kingmaker has a few problems that I think mostly get ironed out in Wrath of the Righteous. My big problem with Kingmaker though is all the timers. So much of that game is timed in some form or another and it can be a little stressful at times honestly, which makes playing it feel a bit more like work than it does like you can just sit down and enjoy the game sometimes which is the part I didn't enjoy about it. Though, it is a great stepping stone from this title to the next, and I do think it's worth playing even if you don't finish it. Most people don't. Coming in on the back half of the list here, we're starting out with Fallout. Now, it's probably worth mentioning right here at this section that I don't like Fallout as much as a lot of people do. I enjoy it, but I'm not crazy about it. And while I wouldn't really call from like Fallout 4 and on CRPGs, with 3 being kind of questionable, the early games, isometric CRPGs, RPGs were still a ton of fun. I'm just not as attached to the world as a lot of others. That said, Fallout 1 is a great experience and holds up surprisingly well, which I believe is down to Bethesda working in some mods to the current release version of it, so you can buy this and actually have it run pretty well with all sorts of options you might not necessarily think would be available, which tends to be a problem with games this old. In the case of Fallout 1, though, I loved the story. I loved everything to do with the super mutants and the master and how all of that is set up and all the extra information and choices you can make along the way. It feels very freeform, allowing you to explore and figure out the world at your own pace in a way that I don't think a lot of the other games ever really did. Which is a nice place to bring up Fallout 2. I like Fallout 2 a little bit more than the original Fallout, mostly because of all the refinements it makes to the systems. Companions are easier to deal with, combat feels a little better, there's more stuff, more things going on, and while there's a few too many, I would say, pop culture references in there for my own personal personal taste, in many ways, gameplay-wise especially, it's a big step up from the original title, and I think a lot of what they did with the world building was really cool here as well. 
And while honestly it's difficult for me to pick between this and the original, I think Fallout 2 wins by just a little bit. However, not to be outdone, we then have Fallout New Vegas, considered the best by a lot of people. This one being from Obsidian, of course, there's probably not much I could tell you about this one you haven't already known, but I really did love it. And a lot of that is simply down to the way Obsidian approaches making games. And realistically, I think if the game ran better even these days, it would probably be a little higher up on this list. But one of my favorite things about New Vegas in particular is how much better the world feels here than a lot of other games, and Bethesda ones even. You see, other fallouts have this problem of any given location turning into this huge sprawling dungeon, whereas sometimes in New Vegas you walk up on an old abandoned gas station and that's all it is. It's like one room and there's not much in it, and that creates this sense of realism, and that's to say nothing of all the other things Fallout New Vegas has going for it. But mostly, it was just the easiest fallout for me to get immersed in. Right above that, though, we have Icewind Dale 2, a game I enjoyed a great deal. While it still focuses more on the dungeon crawling than the Baldur's Gate series does, Icewind Dale 2 does put a bit more emphasis on the story than the original, and that story is quite good. You can see hints of a sort of scrapped evil option, which I think is a shame, so definitely don't overlook it if you are checking out all of your isometric games. And I believe most recently they actually finally managed to uh, piece together the enhanced edition for Icewind Dale 2, which is actually a mod project, I believe, if my memory serves, so there's even a decent way to jump into this one and enjoy what it has to offer. But I liked it quite a bit. Then we have Temple of Elemental Evil. The first game from Troika of their three games, Temple of Elemental Evil, takes place largely inside what is considered one of the original mega dungeons. And that's going to see us exploring nearby towns, a few different ways to start the game based on your party alignment. Once you actually get to the dungeon, there's choices and consequences to those choices to be had. Not to mention it's one of the only CRPGs to mess around with D&D 3.5, which was the precursor to the Pathfinder series, which I'm personally really partial to. So there's a lot of unique things about Temple of Elemental Evil, which is what makes it unfortunate that it's a little difficult to actually play these days. You're going to have to buy it on GOG. And there's a couple different patches, uh, Circle of Eight and Temple Plus, that are practically mandatory if you want the game to run. And even then, it can still be a little unstable, let's say, which is the main detriment to trying to play it. It is, in my opinion, worth it, though. Next up, we have Jade Empire, a very bizarre little game from BioWare that is kind of, I would say, the middle ground between old BioWare and new BioWare before they started focusing more more on action-oriented games, as opposed to their more traditional CRPG-based roots. As such, Jade Empire puts us in the role of an aspiring martial artist who can follow a couple different morality paths, which leads to some choices and consequences to be had, not to mention a great cast of characters at the same time. And overall, it's a very unique game that it's a real shame that they honestly are never going to do anything with. Again, a lot of people wanted a sequel to this one, but it's not going to happen, which is a shame because if you play through Jade Empire, you might just find that it had something really special going for it. Though speaking of something special, we then have Neverwinter Nights, a game I would say remembered more for its multiplayer aspects than the actual game itself, which was updated with the relatively recent Enhanced Edition. Now, on the single player side of things, the base campaign is remembered as kind of eh, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. It was more just to show you what was possible to do with the tool set that came with the game that let you make and build your own campaigns, which is what formed the bulk of the multiplayer side of things, people running their own servers, and then also some of the community campaigns and things you could download and run through. But the expansion packs for it, Shadows of the Undren Tide and Hordes of the Underdark, are actually really great, and I would highly recommend you play through those for sure if you choose to pick this one up, especially since it's one of the only games, again, that uses Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. And while it's great to play through the base game and those expansions, the multiplayer aspect of it is still going strong today and is what a lot of people remember it for. Then we have Neverwinter Nights 2. Neverwinter Nights 2 was made by Obsidian and in many ways upgrades a lot of these systems with a base campaign and DLC that is much better than the original Neverwinter Nights. However, the multiplayer aspect of this side of things never really caught on as much as most people just didn't want to leave what they had already built with Neverwinter Nights, I would say. And it's my understanding the tool set for 2 was also a bit more difficult to work with on top of that, but it does have one of the best DLCs out there with Mask of the Betrayer, which does a good job of rectifying the terrible ending for the main campaign. 
but I enjoyed the story and gameplay of Neverwinter Nights 2 a great deal, and it's definitely worth checking out. Then we have Shadowrun Hong Kong, the third entry in the Shadowrun trilogy that I would say is definitely the best game gameplay-wise. Now, the only thing that keeps this from being a little higher is that it puts you in a very set role in this universe that has previously been up to you to fill and define which I think is a little bit unfortunate given how the previous entry, Dragonfall, worked especially. So I would say Hong Kong has a decent story with better game mechanics than the previous entries, so it's still pretty fun. But then we have Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura, another game from Troika and really a cult classic these days, and hilariously in my own review of this one, I mentioned that the only way we could ever see a sequel would be if Microsoft bought Activision, who owned the rights, which seemed unlikely at the time, but then actually wound up happening. Though, to be clear, a sequel is still pretty unlikely unless this game suddenly gets a lot more interest than very niche reviewers like myself. But nonetheless, Nonetheless, Arcanum did a lot of really cool, unique things that are frankly a bit too numerous to mention here, but the world building and the story especially were really captivating and some of my favorite things about it. It would be higher up on the list if it weren't just such a janky system, with the character progression system in particular being really bad. But otherwise, a great game, you should definitely check it out. This one will probably require the unofficial patch for it though, so keep that in mind. Then we have Dragon Age Origins. I fully admit I'm not as keen on Origins as most people are. Typically when people talk about Dragon Age, Origins is everybody's favorite, and I really love the Dragon Age series and the world, but I think the love for Origins is a little overblown if I'm being honest. However, that doesn't change the fact that it's still a fantastic game. And it came out of the gate swinging, setting up the Dragon Age world, which is one of my favorite fantasy settings, period, at this point because I find the lore so interesting. And the origin system at play, as the name might imply, is such an incredibly impactful choice that I'm surprised more games haven't tried to follow up on it because it's such a great system. Moving right along, we then have KOTOR 1, though. I like Star Wars, I like CRPGs, and unfortunately for everyone, KOTOR 1 and 2 are really the only Star Wars CRPGs we're likely ever going to get, given that that remake seemingly got cancelled. So, KOTOR setting up the story of Revan with a modified version of D&D 3.5 that sees you making choices and consequences, of course, having to do with the light and dark side of the Force and all this interesting narrative stuff, makes for a fantastic game. You should definitely check it out, even if it's getting a little bit on the older side. Only then, for Obsidian yet again to follow it up with an even better, in my opinion, sequel, KOTOR 2. The second game having an examination of Star Wars principles like the Jedi and the Sith and having interesting things to say about them both that even a lot of the modern stuff just refuses to discuss or address in any way makes it an incredibly memorable game with some really fantastic writing. The gameplay itself honestly isn't that fantastic though, which is why it is not a little bit higher, but it's definitely one of those CRPGs that, in my opinion, is a must play. Right above that we have Original Sin 1, which is the only game on this list I have to give a bit of a caveat for. I haven't actually reviewed Original Sin 1, I'm just putting it on this list because I know people are going to ask me about it, and I have played it backwards and forwards. I really like Original Sin 1, it is, I would say, the more modern imagining of the Divinity Universe that honestly kind of kickstarted the more modern CRPG. RPG renaissance we find ourselves in, culminating in the release of BG3 recently, but Original Sin is an interesting game because it sets up a lot of future success for Larian Studios, but while it is a great game on its own right, it has a lot of problems that you see ironed out in their later stuff, especially with things around continuity in the early game and combat being a little rough around the edges in certain places to be sure, but it had a lot of that trademark reactivity that Larian has become known for, and it's still a really great game. Starting to move into the best of the best territory, we then have Gothic. The first game in the Gothic series, of course. Gothic is a real classic in a lot of respects. Uh, recently, they've actually been making some moves to make this more accessible. That remake is still in the works. We might actually see that eventually. And while Gothic takes a little bit of getting used to these days, especially because of how a lot of the mechanics have become dated and the controls and things like that for the original, make the barrier to entry a little bit high. But if you're willing to get past those things, 
exploring the colony that you find yourself in after you're thrown in prison and forced to mine magic ore, and learning about the ins and outs of that world and some of the existential threats that then come to be make you go from feeling like a nobody to someone making big decisions towards the end of the game, and it's a great RPG curve overall, which is what it's doing so high up on this list. Next up, though, we have Elix, my personal favorite Piranha Bytes game. I loved Elix a great deal. It is such an interesting world that blends modern technology with almost post-apocalyptic setting and a world that is fueled by Elix, a substance that grants people powers but robs them of emotions. And while this first game is certainly as janky as all of the rest of Piranha Bytes games, it's a game that is clearly filled with so much passion and a world that is truly interesting to run through. It's probably one of my most enjoyed games that I've done specifically for the channel on viewer recommendations. Certainly not for everybody, and it certainly has its hosts of problems, but it is a fantastic game otherwise. But then we have the original Risen. Risen was really a return to form after what happened with Gothic 3. Risen, in many ways, I would say, took what worked from Gothic 1 and 2 and really brought it forward, at least for the time, with a lot of updated mechanics, while leaning into what those systems did well. And I had a blast with Risen right up until the end of the game, which somehow drops the ball incredibly hard. So while the ending was a bit lackluster, the rest of the game was still a really fantastic experience. And what's more, this game just last year actually got a bit of an update that allows it to be played on modern hardware with pretty much zero issues. So if you want to check out some of Piranha Byte's work, this is a great place to start. Next up, however, we have Planescape Torment, one of those cult classic games that people love to throw around as one of the best CRPGs ever. And in many ways, I agree. Story-wise, I think Planescape Torment is without equal in a lot of ways. However, the reason it's not higher on this list is that the actual gameplay of Planescape Torment leaves a lot to be desired. It is, in my opinion, not a lot of fun to actually play Planescape Torment. I love the story, and the game is definitely playable once you know what you're doing, sure, but I think it is pretty much being hard carried by that story being as good as it is. Either way, though, people love it for a reason. The story is fantastic. You should definitely check it out, if only for that. And thankfully, it's, again, relatively recent Enhanced Edition makes that a bit easier to do. Which brings us to Gothic 2. Many people's favorite Piranha Bytes title, Gothic 2, takes Gothic 1 and really expands on it in a great way, which makes it a ton of fun. Though, it's worth mentioning that whether or not you're playing this with or without the expansion, Night of the Raven, which rebalances the game with veterans of it in mind, who know exactly what they're doing, and thus the game is quite a bit harder if you don't, is certainly something you need to keep in mind. Personally, I actually wound up playing it twice, once without the expansion and then once with it. And all of those refinements from the original Gothic make for a game that is largely considered by people one of the best things Piranha Bytes ever made. And while my personal favorite game from them is Elix, I do think Gothic 2 is a really fantastic one. Getting into the upper echelons here, we then have Disco Elysium, a very well-praised game that, honestly, you probably know plenty about already. But Disco Elysium is a big narrative adventure that sees us in the role of a somewhat delusional detective who's just trying to work his way through amnesia as he also solves a case. And that can lead to all sorts of hilarious moments where you investigate leads, failing roles miserably only for a different solution to pop up that is equally outrageous all while you deal with a very serious backdrop of everything going on between things like unions, the government, the police station you're supposed to be in contact with, and all sorts of other stuff that culminates to make this really great story. And as narrative heavy games go, this one is a fantastic one, and some of its systems in particular I think are really cool on the gameplay side of things like internalizing thoughts, which then manifests as certain benefits or detriments to your character. And all of that makes for a game that's really fun to play and interact with, even if these kinds of games aren't your normal cup of tea. Moving right along, though, we then have Shadowrun Dragonfall. The best, in my opinion, of the Shadowrun series, Dragonfall, sees you in charge of a full-on team as you take on all sorts of missions and contracts trying to track down exactly what is going on and what led to the death of your dear friend towards the beginning of the game. Overall, though, I think the teammates are really what sell it here. You've got a great list of companions who all have their own story missions. They've also worked out a lot of how individual things should work coming from Shadowrun, and it's a big step up from Returns. 
and really showcases what that setting can really offer in a way that Hong Kong just didn't quite nail down. Which is why it is so high up on this list, but right above that we have Expeditions Rome, my favorite game from 2022, part of the Expedition series. It is a game that has a big emphasis on a sort of tactical RPG side of things, combat that is strategy based. In addition to that, it has full on CRPG mechanics where we are taking on a host of companions, doing side quests for them. In between individual campaigns you take on in Expeditions Rome, you'll have a chance to be in Rome making decisions about the future of your own family on top of your companions and how things work out for them. And that's to say nothing of the exploration during individual war campaigns. And it's just a fantastic game overall. And while you don't see it mentioned much as CRPGs go, I think it's one of the best ones out there. But nonetheless, there are some I would consider better, such as Wasteland 3. Of the modern CRPGs, I think this is a fantastic one. It's also one of the best places to start if you don't know where to start. And while it has a bit of a zanier tone than I would say Wasteland 2 does, it also offers a ton of choice and consequence. There's a ton of different ways this can play out, which leads to all sorts of different endings, and it's a really fantastic game. It's a game that made me very excited for whatever In Exile Entertainment happens to do next, as I think this game alone has earned them that deference, which is why I'm excited for their upcoming Clockwork Revolution. But then we have Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, another title from Troika, and the last one on this list, of course, as that is all three of them. Bloodlines is one of the best vampire games out there, taking place in the World of Darkness, Vampire the Masquerade specifically. We are put in the role of a fledgling vampire, forced to fight our way through the conniving plans of the vampire court, doing our best to simply survive in many cases, certainly being used along the way. But how that happens, down down to the clan of vampires you happen to be involved with and the choices you make throughout the story and how you approach and decisions you make makes for an incredibly dense game. I've played through it personally like seven, eight times, and while realistically you need an unofficial patch to run it well, it's well worth the effort to get all that done, and ahead of Bloodlines 2 you should absolutely play it, and Bloodlines 2 has a huge set of shoes to try to fill when it comes to following up this game, and in some respects, I think no matter what they do, somebody would be disappointed because of how unique and interesting Bloodlines was. I can honestly say I've never played anything quite like it, and while it's not perfect, it is a fantastic game. Right after that, though, we have Baldur's Gate 2, considered by some people to be one of the best CRPGs ever made, and for good reason. It's a fantastic follow-up to the original Baldur's Gate, refining and emphasizing a lot of the mechanics that started with the original, but also allowing high levels of play for advanced Dungeons & Dragons, because the original game only ended at, like, level 8 for most characters, whereas this one goes all the way into the epic levels. Personally, I don't like it quite as much as 1, because I think it just gets a little too much towards the end, and Baldur's Baldur's Gate 1 manages to keep things a little more grounded, but in fairness to Baldur's Gate 2, it does end with you potentially becoming a god or letting that power slip through your hands, so it's not like the story wasn't going places. Either way though, iconic game, iconic story, you should definitely play it. Next up with Baldur's Gate, again, just my personal preference, I enjoy this one more than the second entry, and I think the gameplay with Saravok, your character, and all the characters that get set up in this game alongside the story about the Iron Conspiracy and the Iron Throne and everything are just fantastic. And to me, Baldur's Gate here is really just like the pinnacle of those old CRPGs before the more modern golden era we find ourselves. In. Speaking of those more modern games, though, right above that I have Pillars of Eternity 1. Again, one of those games that used Kickstarter to really kickstart the CRPG revival that we have going on. Pillars of Eternity came out swinging from Obsidian with its own system, its own incredibly deep world. And second to something like the Divinity Universe, one of my personal favorites. I love what they did with the lore here, it's really interesting. And while Pillars of Eternity 1, I think, suffers from being a Kickstarter project a little bit, as there are so many backer characters in the game that you can run across that just have like mountains of text that don't really add anything to the game and things like that, and other slightly less refined systems like not being able to see what your character has coming up for level ups can get in the way of that experience a little bit. Overall, it's a great game, and I think the experience expansions, the White March Part 1 and 2, really are some great content. Nonetheless though, still a few games I think are better than 
and this one starting with Under Rail. Under Rail, in my opinion, is one of the best indie CRPGs, period. It is incredibly good. It's also a pretty difficult game in comparison to a lot of other CRPGs, so it can be a little demanding of your time and attention, but if you've got those things to spare, Under Rail is an incredibly rewarding experience as you get to grips with what this world has to offer. Set in underground railways, we find ourselves embroiled in a sort of larger plot in between all sorts of factions as the remnants of humanity simply try to get by. There's all sorts of secrets and little hidden things to find, and finding ways through the game with different builds I think is just a really rewarding experience. Though there is a follow-up to this game coming via Under Rail Infusion, a sort of sequel, that is also worth keeping on your radar if you happen to enjoy this one. But above even that, we then have Tyranny, a CRPG from Obsidian that released in between Pillars 1 and 2. Tyranny is fantastic. You mostly play the bad guy, though there is one good option through the game, but it's a game with an incredibly unique world where often you have to choose between different brands of evil which leads to all sorts of incredibly difficult moral situations alongside interesting characters and factions. But what I love most about this game, honestly, is its spellcrafting system, which I have to mention basically every time I talk about it, as it is incredibly good. So while Tyranny, unfortunately, will probably never see a sequel or anything due to its sales, etc., the usual stuff, I do think it is one of the better games Obsidian has ever made. And it's a shame it doesn't get more love. Nonetheless, though, hitting the top five now, we then have Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader, a very recent release just this past December, with the first CRPG in the Warhammer 40k universe, putting us specifically in the role of a rogue trader, which is someone with a great deal of freedom to pursue building their own trading empire, which can see them literally owning many different planets, all while dealing with the onslaught of the forces of chaos and the warp and all the dangers therein. And that's to say nothing of all the companions and side systems you can get engaged with, and overall I would say I liked this game a great deal. In fact, it pretty much inspired me to get involved in Warhammer 40k, which I didn't really know much about prior to learning about and prepping for this game. Now, it is a decent bit buggy, especially since its launch, but a lot of that is being fixed up as it stands, and I think the game's only going to get better from here with multiple DLCs to come that I'm looking forward to. And having a CRPG to play through that universe with was a real treat. So that is naturally what it's doing so high up on this list. Fourth from the top, we have Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. One of my favorite CRPGs, I would say, though admittedly a little farther back than the top portion of this list. The reason it's so much higher than a list of my favorites, though, is because of everything it does mechanically. It addresses and works on basically everything from the original title, and while the theme of the game centering around an archipelago with things like piracy and whatnot isn't exactly everybody's cup of tea, it is nonetheless a great game and a great sequel, improving on so many of those mechanics and allowing you to get really immersed in this world and the unique system that they made for this. So if you're looking for an isometric CRPG that is a little like the older titles, I think Deadfire is one of your best options, especially if you want something that doesn't overwhelm you with choices like some of the Pathfinder titles, for instance. Though third up on our list, we have Divinity Original Sin 2, one of my favorite games, period, and the game that got me started on the Divinity universe. As I loved it so much, I got to learning about it, made tons of YouTube videos about it as I went through all of that knowledge, and while I wouldn't say it's the best CRPG out there because of things like some clunky systems like the armor, for instance, it's such a wonderfully reactive game with a unique world that Larian can truly call their own given that it's not based on any other IP but theirs. And the many ways you can play through this game, both with all sorts of different character builds as well as options and choices that lead to all sorts of different endings, makes for a tremendous title, one of the best CRPGs, period. Second from the top, however, we have Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. My personal favorite CRPG, but honestly I don't think the best one, but it speaks to me personally, and that is because of all the different ways you can play through this title. The Mythic Path system in particular I think is incredibly epic, it sees you taking on the role of some being of higher power such as a demon, an angel, an aeon even, and many many others, and all of that choice and consequence put up against how you choose to lead the Fifth Crusade against the demon demons of the world wound leads to an incredibly epic campaign that I don't think much of anything else has managed to match in sheer scope. 
really the only thing holding this game back, in my opinion, is the very high barrier to entry. It's fantastic once you get used to it, but there's so many options here that it's very difficult to onboard people. My own new player's guide for this is like two hours long, which is a huge ask for someone just trying to pick something up and play it. It's wonderful if you have the time to do that, and if you don't, obviously it's not so great, which is why it's not the top of this list. The top of this list, as I'm sure many people have already guessed or looked ahead for, is Baldur's Gate 3. My second favorite CRPG, as it were, because while I think it lacks a lot of the incredibly deep systems like Wrath of the Righteous that I really enjoy, opting instead to use Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, which obviously the Baldur's Gate series would use as it's set in D&D's Forgotten Realms setting, it is nonetheless gameplay-wise the best CRPG out there, and it comes with all sorts of choice, consequence, the reactivity that Larian is known for, moving stories involving all the different origin characters, characters that you can also play as your own avatar should you so choose. For sheer scope alone, Baldur's Gate 3 outdoes everything else and it's not close. Realistically, I think there are other things I enjoy more about other CRPGs on an individual basis, but total package, it's Baldur's Gate 3 all day. And seeing how I've made tons, probably in the ballpark of hundreds, of videos about it already, I think you get the gist. And that is finally where we're going to leave off this incredibly long ranking of all of my favorite favorite CRPGs, and believe it or not, I have yet more to review. Give it a couple years, I might have to remake this again when I've finished the Gene Forge series, the Avernum series, maybe taking a look at Queen's Wish, and any other CRPGs that have yet to release. As I do, if this video couldn't tell you, love the genre. But that is going to do it for this particular video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think about all of these. I would love to hear about it. But regardless of all that, truly, just thank you so much for watching this incredibly long video, which is basically just me gushing about loving games. Truly, thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.